Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And we have a returning guest today who appeared back in October 2020, um, which was episode 101. We have Stephen Stewart, who's the chairman of All Group, uh, a Canadian-based natural resources discovery and development organisation who pair people, projects and capital to create wealth for their shareholders and communities. Um, Stephen has, has directorships with a number of TSX-listed companies, including Baseload Energy, Ore Finders, Q, QC, Copper and Gold. Um, he's also the, the founder and chairman of Young, uh, Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund, which is the largest mining-focused uh, charitable organisation and fund supporting mine uh, engineering and geology education in Canada. Um, Steve is going to speak to us about all group and associated companies um, within, um, obviously, this podcast, and also talk about some of the Canadian Canadian uh, supply chains um, and why gold is his favourite commodity. So that's welcome back to the episode, Stephen. How you doing, Stephen? I'm doing very well, uh, Rob. Great to be back. I can't believe it's been, uh, you know, th- almost three years since we last spoke. I was 101. Now you said I'm over 300. Well, uh, you've been yeah. really busy. You've been really busy. So good for you. And I've been following you all along. So uh, you, you you produce a uh, great content for uh, for your audience. So pleased to be back. Yeah, appreciate appreciate the uh, compliments. Um, wondering if you can, uh, for those that obviously didn't, hadn't listened to that previous episode, I do encourage you to go back. So it was episode 101, um, which is back in October 2020. So please go back and have a listen to that episode. Um, and then obviously what you can see is from after listening to this, see how far Stephen and the company have grown since then. So um, why don't you give us a quick snapshot or an overview of yourself um, before we go into a series of questions. Sounds good. Yeah, well, uh, as you said, uh, um, I'm the chairman of the org group. That's my day job. And uh, as, a, as a passion project, I've, I've been um, the driving force behind the Young Mining Professionals, which has evolved. But, uh, but yeah, I'm here to talk about um, the org group. I'm here to talk about the mining and metal space and, and specifically within uh, our operations and broader, broader uh, operations uh, or just the industry as a whole in Canada and how, how important that's evolved. Um, due to largely geopolitical issues, but really these issues we've seen time and time again, and really goes back to the essence about jurisdiction and safety and and why we've taken that specific position. Well, let's uh, stay close to Canada. And, and when I say we, I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the Or Group. The Or Group's a private company, which is uh, representative of, of, of people. I mean, you and I talked about how people are so important, and that's uh, one of our taglines, I guess, you know, how we define the Or Group is people, property, and capital. And that's that's what we do, and, and we have a, a certain way of doing business, and and uh, and it, it, a huge focus is on can, uh, people, and a huge focus is of course on Canada. And within that, we've got six publicly traded companies: uh, American Eagle, uh, which is in, in British Columbia and focuses on copper gold. We've got QC Copper, which has got our, um, what we think is going to be um, Canada's, if not uh, certainly Quebec's next um, great open pit copper deposit. We've got our um, original company called Warfinders Resources, which uh, is is evolving, and I can talk a little bit more about how it's evolving in 2023 and our plans for it. And then we've got Mustango River Resources. Those two companies have been focused on gold exploration at the Kirkland Lake uh, camp. And then we've got our um, um, Metal Energy, which is one of our newer companies, which is focused on nickel um, in Manitoba and the Thompson Belt. And last but not least, Baseload Energy. Uh, which made a uranium discovery um, in uh, the, towards the end of 2021 and, 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 and put a whole lot of meters in it in 2022. And we're just about to start the drills back up on that uh, discovery this year. So it's been, since we spoke, um, lots has occurred um, on the ore group. And uh, 2022 was busy and 2023 is going to be interesting. And so, um, you know, that's, that's, that's who we are and what, what we're focused on. Yeah. So I um, wondered if we could rewind and wondered if you can just tell us what's happened over the last uh, year, or even if you wanted to go back to the since we last recorded, if you can remember that far back. Um, but yeah, just wondered what's happened over the last year or two within the business. 
Sure. Well, I'll talk about QC Copper. I think, um, you know, it's it had a, a extremely busy. I think it put more meters into the ground than any of our companies uh, in 2022. It put nearly 60,000 meters. Um, I like to say it's our flagship asset. And when I say flagship asset, I mean, everything changes and everything's relative. But in terms of um, my best guess, an educated guess, and something becoming a mine at some point in the future, we think that's it. Um, obviously, anything can change um, uh, in terms of other assets could supersede it. But I mean, we just know so much about this asset and it just checks all the boxes. And as I said, we drilled 60,000 meters off a, off a milestone that we published in the end of 2021, which is um, 104 million tons at 0.88% uh, copper equivalent, which is uh, nearly, if you round up a little bit, um, about 2 billion pounds of copper pit constrained in the middle of the Quebec um, with rail, road, clean, low cost, renewable energy. And as I said, it checks all of the boxes. Um, and, and since that resource, we've put that 60,000 meters into optimizing that. And when I say optimizing, I mean, drilling it out, infill drilling, uh, converting a lot of what was considered waste, um, calculated as waste in the, the initial resource, but is in fact ore. Anything over 0.2 is going to be considered ore. So it's going to be, a, a, a we think, a much better resource. So we're excited about that. That's coming out in June of this year. So that's a major milestone. Um, the other, you know, I'll dovetail into baseload energy. I think that's very exciting. A lot of, lot of followers uh, have been following that company. It made a grassroots discovery um, in, in the Athabasca Basin using a different approach. The, people love the Athabasca for uranium for good reason. It's got grades that are unparalleled, literally unparalleled. Uh, anywhere in the world. The problem is, has always been the water and how do you extract it? So, I mean, if you can find 20% uranium, wow, that's a bonanza. But if it costs you effectively 25% to take it out of the ground, that's not ore, that's waste. Uh, so James, uh, James Sykes, our CEO, uh, uh, you know, really is a top-notch guy when it comes to uranium, tops in my book, certainly. Uh, you know, we all had a different approach. Well, we didn't want to just drill 20%. We wanted to drill something economic. It's not, you know, grade isn't king, margin is king. And so uh, we went about finding something outside of the basin, uh, basin closer, um, um, well, closer to surface and outside of all those water issues, because that sandstone is like a big sponge and water pours in. And if you can't, you know, get rid of the water, you can't mine anything effectively without freeze uh, walling, you know, your your open pit or your uh, your resource, which is crazy expensive. So baseload had a different approach. Um, which is which is an approach that the, we used to look for uranium in the past, but then when the industry started to find these so-called unconforming deposits, which are incredibly rich at you know 10, 15, 20 percent, uh, people got distracted. So we just went back to first principles, um, looked in a little bit of different area, and we made a success, which is you know we beat the odds uh, because you know again uh, you, you have to beat the odds to make a discovery in this in this business. So that and then and then subsequent to that, baseload raised a ton of money and put a lot of meters. Uh, into that in 2022, I would say that was our second most drilled uh, project in 2022 and put out a lot of news and we were hitting. I mean, we were just, you know, hit, hitting it almost in every hole, which was very encouraging. And we're going to go back out there, um, uh, uh, you know, soon in, in the next uh, month or so. I, I suspect those drills will be spinning and trying to further delineate that resource, obviously, with the objective to, to define it uh, in terms of um, pounds in the ground. Um, and then uh, I think the other company that was, I think, you know, probably my biggest source of frustration, which is probably the most overlooked company was called a company called Metal Energy. I noted that we, that's our newest company, the, 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 the newest company we did, and it's our exposure to nickel, because I love nickel. Um, yeah, as you said, gold is my favorite, and it is, uh, but, but there's a huge space for nickel, and there's serious su supply constraints on nickel, and so we acquired an old uh, Falconbridge mine um, in the south end of the Thompson Belt, which is Nothing short of world class in terms of uh, uh, production, historically speaking, and continued production by Valet. Um, and, and they have a mill there and everything. Just like I said, QC Copper, this checks all the boxes in terms of infrastructure. There's already a mill there. There's a you know highway, et cetera. And we um, we we drilled it out. You know, I guess we stumbled out of the gate. You know, after the IPO and and sort of had trouble um, catching up because we couldn't get our drill permits when we went IPO. And so we started off the first six months as a public company without any real drill results. Um, and so, you know, that just sort of people forget your story. This is an inpatient business and it, that sort of gets exacerbated when things are tough and things were tough in 2022. So, uh, but anyways, we caught up, we got our drill permits finally. And then we've put out since then, we've put out some phenomenal results, really. I mean, um, you know, or grades over or wits, uh, our, our most, our, our most recent results were 80 meters at, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 
um, pretty shallow stuff, you know, really, really interesting, but the market is still really tough. It's just, it's really hard to, to, to gain traction. You have to put something out that really captures uh, people's imagination, not just their minds and attention, but their imagination. You got to get them excited. Yeah. So, so that, that, that has been something interesting. And then of course, we've been very busy doing all sorts of things with the uh, ore finders and Mustango, which are two sister companies um, who have been, you know, busy on the acquisition front. I think since we spoke, um, it, uh, those two companies did uh, collectively a $120 million exploration agreement with Ag Agnico Eagle. You know, that's pretty significant. Um, you know, that, that situation is, is ongoing. It's a 10 year commitment. Obviously they, they like our assets. Obviously they like the jurisdiction where we are in Kirkland Lake, where, uh, I think you're going to see continued consolidation, um, there was uh, some M&A that we saw amongst juniors just the other week there, which again speaks to that area. Uh, I'm a big fan of consolidation, you know, amongst the junior mining industry. Um, so, so yeah, those are just some of the highlights off the top. I don't want to go on and on, but, uh, you know, we've 2022 was extremely busy. I would say extremely successful from a, um, call it a technical and operations and development standpoint. We were aggressive with the drill. We delivered good results. We don't know. We can't always deliver good results. It's uh, you know, it's, it's a high risk business and you're going to, you're going to drill more dusters than uh, bonanza holes. That's for sure. Um, and then we're we're hopefully to take everything to the next level, and you know the next level is is a different way. And there's every project is is has its own interpretation of what the next level is, but it's about uh, progression, smart progression. Um, I always say drilling is going to be the secret to our success, and so never stop drilling. But that's always the overhanging you know, aspect or a key element of that is, you know, how do you finance that drilling? And, you know, you don't want to do it and um, uh, completely blow your capital structure or perhaps deliver results when the market just doesn't care. You know, so there are there are times uh, when you need to be smart um, with your capital allocation. And if and uh, if you are delivering results that the market doesn't value, then you have to reassess your timing. And so, you know, that's something that we're constantly monitoring and assessing. And, and uh, you know, and every commodity has a different um, uh, call it an envelope, right? You know, lithium behaves differently than gold and it behaves differently than nickel. And so, and that's part of why the Ore Group's philosophy is really, you know, again, I, I, I come from gold, if you will, like that's where I got hooked on this industry and then re realized that it's a very volatile industry, gold on its own. And so you can have many years of nobody caring about it, which is kind of where we are now, ironically. And we can talk, you know, dig, dig deep onto why I think that is, but but it, it behooves uh, uh, the management teams and, and entrepreneurs in this business to diversify themselves um, and get exposure to a broad range of commodities, which uh, ebb and flow at different times. So you can smooth out so you can eat because <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes you can't eat um, when nobody cares about your particular commodity. So that's part. You know, it's not the sole reason for the oil group, but that's you know part of our philosophy is to be diversified in a highly cyclical uh, industry, um, but not. Um, but do so as intelligently as we can and pick the commodities that we like. We, we stay away from the flavors of the day and try and stick to, as I said, you know, gold, copper, nickel, uranium. Um, I like those um, at all times. I like them even more when everybody hates them, though. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, obviously, capital raising um, or mentioned capital. Have you noticed uh, what I noticed towards the end of last year? was obviously a lot of share prices took a big hit and everyone that i or a lot of people that i got onto got on the podcast what they were moaning about or what some of the challenges was obviously share price down but it seemed a difficult market in which to raise capital i see a different a bit of a different outlook come 2023 is that what is that what you're seeing or well, i wonder if you can comment on capital raising in the market at the moment yeah, I would say, you know, the second half of 2022 was really ugly and, the, you know, there there really wasn't a lot of capital coming into the space. I, I still think it's difficult. You know, certainly the, the 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 pool of capital shrinks as called the TSXV as a whole comes down. And so people are are less and less incented to place risk capital um, on the line. Uh, coming out of the gate in, 20, in 2023, in January, we came out strong. And I think a lot of that was, um, you know, annual cyclicality people come out of 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 december feeling um optimistic i think that's just human nature like you know it's new year let's go 
Um, and, and I see that, you know, not every year, but, mo but most years, but I think particularly we bounced from a really ugly, you know, December and second half of, of 2022. And so again, people thought they were um, investing at the bottom, uh, particularly with tax loss selling. So, so there was that pop and then um, gold, which sort of leads everything, uh, you know, kind of indirectly uh, has stumbled. And, and, you know, I, I haven't seen it today, but it's, you know, it, at this, this week it was flirting with going, you know, below 1800. If you li listen to the technical al analysts, they're saying it's going to hit, you know, 1780 and then, you know, run, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, again, it was almost flirting with, you know, the, the mid 19s, you know, so, uh, so it, it, it was really, it was really running there, but uh, it's pulled back. Um, financing is available. Uh, I think it's for select commodities. Copper financing is available. Lithium, of course, has been available. And I think, you know, God, um, you know, I think th there's too much money chasing lithium. I think, you know, that that's just sort of momentum money. I think the smart money should be selling that sort of stuff and investing it into things that are 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 less loved, like gold, um, and and have a little bit more um, value. I mean, because that's that's ultimately, I mean, you know, what everybody is chasing, and then there's a huge disconnect between price and value. So, um, sort of answer your question. I mean, there there is money available. It's not. It's certainly not a frothy market, unless you've been in lithium, you know, and that's just sort of something that's been been running. But I think that's going to change, or is is changing for sure. Um, and then, of course, your cost. Okay, so you're gonna have you have to you have to give up a bigger slice of the pie to 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 do that. So if you do have cash in your treasury. Uh, I, I think that's probably one of the most important things for your typical retail investors. Look how much cash that company has, and 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 their desire or their their need to raise additional funds, and and uh, you know that 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 would be the first thing I do uh, when I evaluate any company is is how much cash do they have right now in this tough market? Because if they need more cash, uh, they're going to have to go back to the trough and and uh, and sell a larger piece of the company. How important is Canada in the global uh, supply chain? Um, and, and and in terms of security uh, of as well of supply uh, for obviously many of these minerals and metals that are that the world needs for the future future of humanity and also obviously the green revolution as well. Well, I think Canada is is probably the most important single um, country in the resource space, if you will. I, I'm biased first first and foremost. One, I'm Canadian, and two. Um, very patriotic and three, that's where I focus my business. But I focus my business because Canada is so well endowed with a with a tremendous amount of of natural resources, whether that's you know oil and gas, copper, gold, nickel, uranium, zinc, you name it, we have it. And we have a huge land mass. and 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 largely a lot of that land mass is 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 call it underpopulated relative to other places. Like you know, the United States has a comparable land mass, but it's got at least ten times as many people and and more sparse uh, more populated. Uh, distri distributed, normally distributed, uh, if if I if you if I may, so you know we're really well set up uh, to to be able to extract because you don't want to put these mines necessarily in, in in overpopulated areas. But I think you know ninety percent of Canada's population is hundred kilometers from the U.S. border, so that just leaves a huge landmass, and it is and it is well endowed. And so uh, first, that's the first and foremost. We we actually have these resources. We've got a sea of oil in Alberta. We've got a ton of nickel in in, in northern Ontario. We've got gold all throughout northern Ontario and Quebec. We've got porphyries uh, uh, dotted all throughout, um, which is copper, gold, molybdenum, silver, and other things all throughout the uh, the, the west coast. Uh, and the Maritimes has a whole basket of, of things. So, and, and of course, Manitoba's got nickel. Uh, and, and I don't know if I mentioned Saskatchewan having uranium. So literally we sort of run the gamut, certainly of the major commodities. And so I think, why 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 do I think that's so important? Because I think the whole geopolitical uh, landscape is has changed. Um, and, and and I won't say for good because, you know, everything ebbs and flows and there's cyclicality and, and the geopolitics, but it's changed for a while. And I think the change changes are significant. And who our friends are, and who we do business with, and and who ultimately the consumer wants to do business with, because I think the consumer, more and more, is saying no, I don't want um, inputs from that company being in my iPhone, etc. Uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is simply the, you know logistics, being able to secure uh, shipping from, um, you know, e Europe or Asia or Australia, and allowing that ship to be. Uh, a available and B sa safely and, re and reliably transported to wherever it may go. So I think we're seeing, uh, I don't think we are seeing a, a major change in deglobalization. 
And so security of supply is 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 absolutely critical. And so I think to have it have um, these commodities on the continent, on the continent being North America, is going to be super important when you consider the, the next part of my argument is that uh, everybody has been catering to China. You know, that is the super cycles of, of yesteryear. And and while I don't think that's going to, you know, fall off the map, I think it's going to change dramatically. And, and, and frankly, I'm betting on the United States. Um, that's where I think the real growth is going to come from in the next, you know, uh, many, many years. It's uh, Warren Buffett always says, don't bet against America. And, and he's right in this particular instance. And I think the world has bet against America um, in, in many instances. And I, and, I, and I think that both Canada and America have a lot of uh, realizations to make before these uh, transitions towards reindustrialization, the remanufacturing uh, or I should say rebuilding of the manufacturing industry um, uh, on our continent. So we really need a, a political shift, but I think it's all inevitable. I think the cards, you know, are on the table. And um, um, and so, you know, that's where I think the customer is going to be going to be the United States and Canada. But obviously, the United States is substantially larger. They are going to be building um, the roads and the bridges and the tunnels and and all the, the highways and the the new clean energy uh, economy on top of that. But it's not it's it's more than the the, the electrical revolution. It's really just traditional infrastructure, which uh, China and the East have are are a generation ahead. And so the United States is is behind. It needs to catch up. Um, it had been playing along with the East um, in terms of everybody's friends, but it appears everybody's not quite as friendly uh, as as we had hoped. And certainly, I hope that changes. Look, I hope everybody learns to get along. That's that's the best thing. And I'd like to go back to the globalization and and everybody just lives peacefully. I mean, this this whole war is just terrible. I want everybody to put their guns down and just sort of you know go back to their families. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that's not happening anytime soon. And I think it's going to evolve. Uh, into into sort of adversarial ways, which are going to have fundamental impacts on on where we get these uh, commodities, and so that's why this is not a new story. Okay, this is we've seen this time and time again, but we've just had this Pax or this peace for so long that people have forgotten what um, um, geopolitical, true geopolitical crises are all about. And uh, I th and I hope that doesn't happen, but it's on the table. And so that's why I think to be able to uh, have security of supply in Canada or the United States is absolutely critical. In fact, uh, you know, having access to natural resources, and that includes oil and gas and all the traditional, and but obviously the hard metal stuff that I focus on is an, is it is it an issue of national security? That's what it's become. It's not just about economics; it's about national security. Uh, making sure you've got these critical elements to 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 be able to live your lives and and, and potentially defend yourself. Um, obviously, you mentioned that um, obviously you're pretty passionate uh, about Canada. You're patriotic. Um, why is uh, and this probably explains why the oil group has focused all of its activity within Canada. Um, are you potentially looking for projects outside of Canada, or are you really just solely focused in in can uh, mining in Canada? I, it, it, throughout my career, I've been um, to a lot of different places, um, and I, I never say never. And I think there's a lot, a lot of wonderful jurisdictions. And I never, um, uh, I'll always evaluate a a project um, on its own merits before saying um, yes or no to anything. So no, I'm not exclusive to Canada. I would be opportunistic, but you know, the, it would have to check a lot of boxes because you know, the, why would I invest that marginal dollar in you know country X as opposed to Canada? Uh, because we do have a lot of competitive advantages there outside of, you know, the sort of ge geopolitical issues I, I mentioned. I also tend to know the geology better here. I tend to know the um, politicians, federal, provincial. Uh, I tend to know the First Nations better. So we understand the customs. So there's just this competitive advantage. So that project outside of our known universe has to be that much better to compete with our allocation of capital. That said, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, but I but I've invested overseas and it hasn't always worked out. And and that begs to another thing is you need a trusted local partnership, which takes time to develop as well. So so there's an awful lot of considerations because if you're spending five and ten million dollars in exploration project, um, and me myself, I'm not the technical person, right? I'm more the allocator of capital. 
um, you know, you don't want to just hand that off to somebody you don't know and trust and you're not monitoring. I mean, that's that's a lot of money uh, that can go in a lot of places that isn't efficient. And so, you know, to 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 have it on the other side of the world and and, and be proper, uh, have the proper controls and monitors in place is, is, is extra challenging. So again, it go, goes back to people and relationships. But Canada is not the only place in the world, that's for sure. But that's, that's certainly uh, the place where we focus uh, uh, for very good reason. Uh, what metals do you want additional exposure to? Um, and what is frothy lithium like? Well, I mean, I mentioned, you know, frothy and lithium. I think there's a huge place. Like, I would like to get exposure to lithium, just not now. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I I tend not to chase things on 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 the pole, if you will. And uh, and I understand why people do, it, which is actually the, the exact opposite of what you should be doing. So while I do believe... Um, in the narrative that there is not enough lithium to fulfill these these demands uh, that are being forecasted, which you know I think those those forecasts are completely wrong, but uh, but I do think they will happen in time, and I do believe that um, call it you know that the electrical car is a better mousetrap, but I don't think it's been fully properly holistically evaluated in terms of its inputs. Uh, in terms of how clean and how green it is, right? I mean, again, if you're if you're plugging it in in you know parts of the United States, well, you're you're powering it on coal, um, you know. So so it's not a zero emission. And 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 if you're going to mine it, uh, you know, uh, or a battery, you know, and if it's you're doing a sort of a uh, eight one one battery, which has a lot of um, obviously nickel is the the eight, and but it's got one cobalt. Where's that cobalt coming from? You know, is that done green and sustainably? Probably not. It's probably coming from the Congo. Um, so, so there are, I think that whole situation needs to be considered, but nonetheless, as I said, it's a better product, so it's coming. And, uh, I think lithium is, is while the recipe, you know, changes and, and it will continue to evolve in, in terms of what inputs go into batteries. I think lithium is there for a while, certainly in a com commercial scale. So I like lithium, but I just, I'm just commenting on the fact that I call it frothy, uh, because, you know, there's all these closeology plays being valued at, you know, a hundred million dollars for, you know, having a pebble of a, a pegmatite, you know, it's just crazy. And uh, we've seen that rush before, um, and I think that, uh, and I and I wish them all well, and hopefully they do have the success of a company like, um, you know, Patriot, which has just been, you know, drilling phenomenal intersections, uh, but it's still early days, right? And um, and so um, uh, I, I I do think that, you know, going back to to your question about what commodities I do want more exposure to, well, look, I think all the commodities we have exposure to will have their lithium moment, right? Um, I said I like copper, I like gold. I like nickel and I like uranium. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that uranium had its, you know, lithium moment and all of them will. And gold is going to have its moment too. And so um, I, I just sort of think that, uh, you know, yes, I believe in the, um, you know, call it the traditional infrastructure, which requires copper. I do believe in the electrical, um, um, let's call it evolution as opposed to revolution, because, you know, it, it's going to be uh, take a little bit longer as opposed to a revolution. Uh, but, at, you know, Underlying all this is is really gold. I think gold is the granddaddy commodity. Um, it, it is a bellwether. Um, it's not something to get rich on, but it's certainly something um, that is insurance and certainly something that has been underloved. And I think it's underloved. I think it hasn't performed like it's, you know, quote unquote, expected to. Uh, but I do think it, you know, at, at one point in time, and I'm not smart enough to say when that is, except that, you know, only that I'll say it, it's coming is that one day it's just going to you know, continue to go up and up and up. And, and uh, it, it'd be for all the reasons why um, all the talking heads like myself um, say it will. And that's because of, you know, the uncertainty, fear, um, the printing of money. I mean, let's, you know, the, the amount of money that has been put into circulation is just mind blowing. And, and uh, you know, we have seen the effects of that. Everybody had been calling for inflation for years and years and it never came. And then all of a sudden it's here. Uh, I think we have a new normal of inflation. This going back to two percent is is not happening, you know. Soon, I hope I'm wrong, but I my my instinct tells me that you know the you know five to seven percent per year is going to be the new normal, and, and probably that's not even accurate because I don't really trust how they calculate it. I mean, I think how they calculate it, you know, inflation. Uh, I've always felt that it's always been more than two percent, you know, even when they said it was two percent. But I mean. Uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing double digit inflation easily in the real world. You know, uh, when I go to the grocery store or when I um, go to a restaurant or, or anything you know, else that I buy. So I think uh, inflation is important. And, and I do think as we see additional inflation, additional geopolitical risks, 
uh, potentially even some, you know, bank failures. Um, you know, I think that that is on the table with all of this debt that not just the the politicians and the, the sovereigns have been taking on, but the people, whether that is the cars or the, the university expenses, just expenses. And people have been gobbling up debt. And when you have an, uh, interest rates as high as they are, and, and, and for a long enough period of time, you're going to start to see some capitulation there. And so that is going to have real impacts on the banks. And, it, you know, it, it just could be like one bank could just change it like that. You know, you get one run of the bank on a, on a big name bank that nobody expected, uh, you know, that could just be a catalyst. So, you know, again, I hope that doesn't happen, but I just, I kind of feel like it, it's almost inevitable in some capacity at, at some point in time when I just don't know. Um, with the energy transition becoming more dominant, um, what makes it was the best position uh, from your point of view? Well, I think, you know, as I say, the, the energy transition is is happening um, slowly but surely. Uh, and I think it's very, you know, we have to consider uh, what the politicians are saying and what they want and what they're mandating. And and they say, you know, net zero uh, by 2035. And then they're saying there's other net zero by 2050. I, I don't really know what they all mean by that. I mean, ultimately, what they mean is they're trying to get off um, fossil fuels and the burning of coal, natural gas, and, and oil, in some capacity, and I think that's a noble task. And I think you know the the and again, not just a noble task for you know reducing pollution. I think you know just pollution in your air and 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 all sorts of other things. But again, producing more sustainable energy because eventually there will be you know eventually if you continue burning oil. I don't believe in peak oil and in, in how it's traditionally classified because I think that's a function of price, right? So, I mean, you can, oh, there's always more oil, but eventually there will be no more oil, but I don't think that's necessarily on the horizon because there's, you know, as the shale revolution proved to us, there's no, there's no, um, um, no end, no end in sight. If you want it, the question is now the politicians don't want it. So they're, they're in effect shooting the oil industry in the foot, which I think is going to backfire and it's starting to backfire because um, you can't just turn flip the switch and, and, and move to, a clean green energy. It it's going to take decades, maybe maybe generations. I don't know, but I know it's not happening in you know ten years because again, just to produce, we talked about you know the electrical just to produce that. Where do you think steel is made, or how do you think steel is made? How do you think iron ore is mined? I mean, from diesel diesel trucks then put into the smelter, which burns the coal. I mean, it's just like you cannot change that um, overnight. And so I just don't think that these forecasts have been um, thoughtfully implemented. Uh, and then I think you get situations like you're seeing, you know, in Ukraine and, and, and you just call it Europe, really, where they've got, you know, um, natural gas prices have gone up exponentially. And so uh, and, and and on natural gas, I think that, you know, natural gas is, is um, you know, a lot of smart people will tell you natural gas is the perfect transition I think I wish there would be more focus on natural gas because I don't think we can just turn off fossil fuels as a whole, but I do think we can um, be better about turning off the dirtier ones faster while moving into a transition uh, carbon fuel like natural gas. You know that, that 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 certainly Canada is abundant with. It is certainly clean relative. It's not you know it leaves a footprint, uh, but so does everything. So uh, I, I think that's going to be. Um, a cold hard truth that's going to have to come back uh, and be reevaluated is a transition not immediately to you know um, wind and solar and batteries, but uh, I think natural gas and of course uranium um, has to be considered uh, in that as well. And I think that's part and parcel of the uranium narrative is 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 finally it has been adopted by uh, many, not certainly not all, but many of the the, the quote unquote green uh, lobby. Um, they're shifting their narrative. Uranium used to be, uh, you know, uh, the devil. I was going to say the devil's metal, but I think that's that's uh, that's that's nickel. Uh, but we won't get into that. But it it used to be sort of um, chastised because of the fear around nuclear waste or nuclear meltdowns. Um, I think it's clear for anybody who takes the time to educate themselves on um, the externalities and the risks associated with um, producing um, and burning or producing and expending, I should say, a unit of energy. I think uranium is amongst the cheapest and certainly the safest um, um, modes, but it does have big CapEx expenditures. And, and there just is this aura around you know, um, 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 disasters. Uh, but I think you know, we can produce it 
uh, we can mine it safely, we can expend it safely, and it, and it produces a ton of uh, base load energy. And that's not just a plug for our, our junior called base load. We call it that for good reason, because you know it's just it's just constantly there, and it can't be sort of turned off uh, uh, or you know off and on like the you know, intermittent like the, the wind and solar. So. So I think you know the, the, again I'm I'm a big fan I think I'm a big believer in the the evolution of how we uh, consume and produce energy, but I think it's just we we have to we have to think about it holistically, uh, we have to plan thoughtfully, and we have to be a little bit patient. And I do think that the both sides I mean there's just it's, it's become so political that I think both sides need to sort of get over this tribal um, fighting and uh, being over one side or the other and and. You know, you're either left or you're right, and you can't be in the middle. And this just sort of is not conducive to um, uh, the conversations which are absolutely necessary to have. And I think if everybody just calmed down and had a rational conversation and just sort of tried to remove emotions and politics out of the situation, there's there's clear solutions. And, and I think I just I just wish everybody would focus on solutions as opposed to uh, uh, throwing mud and 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 not, and not listening. You mentioned obviously gold being your favorite uh, metal. Why is that? Um, I, I I don't know. It's just so darn pretty. Um, and, and I think there's just this inherent quality to it. So I mean, I think it does have this um, this inherent quality that that is that is um, unique unto itself. and and that's why it has been the monetary metal for uh, they say five thousand years, but probably ever since it was found is because it is so unique and it's you know not tarnishable. It's but virtually indestructible. Um, but I but I am I I do think that. It is um, got legs, if you will. Um, it, it ebbs and flows, but it, it has uh, endurance in terms of its demand and supply. Uh, I am, um, while I, as I said, I love uh, copper, nickel, and, and uranium for um, industrial reasons and and growth, which I'm, I'm even though I do sort of see some tough times ahead, I do believe growth is coming. As I said, the United States is is going to be where that growth is coming from. But I think. Uh, there's also uh, gold is is in a class by itself because I don't consider it a commodity. I consider it a currency. And um, and I think in a world where virtually all other currencies short of gold, or other call it elemental uh, currencies like a silver, um, all of the other currencies have eventually gone to zero over a long enough period of time. And again, I I hope in my in in my lifetime in my 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 daughter's lifetime that we don't see that. But we have to we have to consider that it's possible, because all empires do, just like fiat currencies, come to an end. And again, I don't think like I don't want a fear monger at all. I don't think that's happening. But I think you know you can have a serious correction without a collapse. And I think um, you know if there was a revaluation or a default or a, a, of a materiality, you really want to have exposure to gold and physical stuff, and not to stuff like you know. Again, I talk taking to another level. And again, I don't want to be fear mongering, but I, something that scares me is call it a um, electrical, um, a, call it um, warfare, where they can shut down the, the grid. And so you know, we've seen you know Texas last year when it had that snowstorm was this close to shutting down the grid, and apparently if you shut down the grid, it's so again the, the United States needs to you know focus on that. Apparently, it's so sensitive it would take months to sort of kick it back up. And so what happens? And so, you know, you just, I guess I'm just the, just want to um, be a little bit conservative. And, and and that's why I particularly like gold, because I think stuff like that, especially increased geopolitical uh, scenarios where, you know, um, someone from overseas could come at us in, in that direction. Um, that would be something like we haven't seen in my lifetime. And, and I think that would be a real shock to the system, because I think uh, as a whole, and myself included, we've become complacent, um, you know, to sort of say the euphemism, we've become fat and lazy because life has been relatively easy. Uh, we have not, I mean, and this is, of course, you know, in the Western world, we have not, um, you know, there's been exceptions, but we haven't had, you know, world wars and stuff like that. So, you know, we've just been um, accustomed to Facebook and Instagram. But life um, can be an awful lot more complicated than that. And and I think eventually, you know, those realities will set in, but I'd love to defer it for, as I said, as long as humanly possible. What are some of the key trends you're seeing in the industry at the moment? Consolidation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, as, as I'm sure uh, all of the audience knows, there's the, the Newmont and the uh, Newcrest merger, which I think has been rejected, but it's not, you know, it's probably, you know, will happen in some 
um, reincarnation at some point in time and and others i've seen a lot of uh, you know juniors lately which is great then why do i think consolidation is good well you know um there's consolidations from from the seniors perspective like you know the newmont who produces i don't know seven eight million ounces of gold gold equivalent ounces a year to be able to replace that organically through their pipeline is like forget about it so you know they have to buy a new crest they have to buy you know uh, an agnico or, or they have to merge with bear in order to maintain that production or they substantially uh, change their production profile you know that that's on the table too but if they are exp in, in a world of growth where you know wall street and these big funds love growth the only way that they can do that on that scale is through acquisition so so they and they you know don't forget the, the, this is a depletion business here so so i think you know consolidation amongst the big boys is is an absolute necessity uh it's something that had been deferred for a long time particularly because in last cycle there was you know what people will cl classify now as irresponsible m a um, and uh, a lot of a lot of CEOs lost their heads, so to speak. So uh, they have been very careful uh, not to to repeat the mistakes of of before. But I think eventually um, the necessity uh, of replacing those reserves will come into play, and then um, there will be FOMO, and then it will just drive it up. And then and again, just like human nature, everything is repeatable. Uh, they will again make these silly mistakes and then everything will crumble again. But that's, you know, that's a cycle, right? So that, that's that's one aspect and one trend I'm seeing. And again, we're at the early stages of it. I mean, uh, so I think there's a lot of room to grow in terms of the big boys consolidation. And I think also the juniors need to consolidate. There are thousands of us. Uh, there doesn't need to be thousands of us. Most of our projects are non-economic. I mean, you know, and anything can change at any given time. But I mean, you know, most of the companies are liabilities as opposed to assets. Um so there's fragmentation. I think there's there's benefits of of uh, consolidating land packages, evaluating it, you know, holistically as opposed to you know scattered and 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 fragmented. Um, I think there's uh, certainly room for consolidation at the management level to, to to streamline that aspect, and that's something that I'm seeing. You know, of course, the issue uh, with you know, and, and that's something I I focus on. I, I I really go after mergers and acquisitions, and I hope to be able to to complete some more in 2023. But the challenges you face are you know valuations. You know, I, oh, I think my 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 project's worth more than yours, and they sort of you know uh, fight over that. So that's where a lot of deals get done uh, get get lost. And then of course there's um, jobs and egos. You know. You know, valuation jobs and egos. That's what kills M and A. Uh, in a tough market, uh, I think you know, those sort of those the, the the severity or the importance of those changes. And so you tend to see some some deals get through. Uh, just saw a, a merger at Equal and amongst the juniors uh, this week, which I thought was very positive. Um, and so you know, look, I, I I hope to be able to complete some of those uh, myself. So I think. Consolidation is going to be a trend uh, going forward, both at the the big scale and and the smaller guys, which is you know incredibly healthy uh, for for capital allocation and investors in this industry. And lastly, and concluding, uh, what are some of the objective and key milestones uh, for the all group uh, during twenty twenty three? And well, the, is, is there anything else that you want to add as well? Well, the key milestone, I guess, you know, off the top of my head, I think uh, something that I've been working on um, uh, exhaustively and the team has been working on, working on exhaustively is the updated 43101 resource on on our flagship asset in QC Copper called the Opa Misca. Uh, an awful lot of drilling has gone into that. A lot, a lot of care has gone into that. So uh, in and around June, we hope, is is where we expect that milestone to come. I think that um, um, uh, could really be a catalyst for that company, which has sort of gone under the radar um, in 2022. Uh, hopefully, publishing a nice, uh, nice big fat resource there will will, will get us noticed. And then um, other other milestones include just continued drilling. It's just continue to sort of make you know the discovery. There's there's two aspects of of how we approach things. One is to continue drilling a trend. So you've you've you know made a discovery and you want to get it bigger. You want to understand if it goes laterally or at strike the depth. Uh, you know that that's something that we'll we'll continue to focus on. Uh, and then of course we also allocated a not insignificant. Uh, portion of our budget to sort of grassroots discoveries within that. So not drilling through the guts of something or trying to extend a zone. Let's look at something a little bit differently. Look at a secondary tertiary um, fault system that oftentimes is where the gold or the, the good stuff hides. So um, I think, you know, aside of milestones, you asked about milestones, uh, real tangible ones, that's, you know, the, the 43101 um, resource for QC Copper. But then uh, maybe some surprises, and then also um, some M and A. Uh, I think that's something that we're focused on. And also, last, I'll just sort of mention on you know uh, Orefinders, which is one of our companies, is is going to be 
um, really focusing on the chain. It's going to remain an exploration company, but we're really going to um, enhance its ability to um, do additional investments. And so we'll make make some, we're going to go to shareholders. I'm going to ask them to make some changes in terms of our listing to upgrade our listing so that we can uh, more easily invest in um, do some incubation as well, like Warfinders is incubated deals, which has benefited shareholders through dividends and other, um, you know, uh, uh, um, helping our balance sheet, et cetera. Um, and then maybe do some, you know, um, maybe a little bit of activism. That's something that we've done here is when I say activism is buying positions in other companies and and forcing change, simple change uh, at the company to create value in that way. So I think, you know, Warfinders uh, in the not too distant future, some shareholders are going to see uh, a proposal put forward. Uh, we hope our shareholders support us. But it, you know, to me, it makes perfect sense. There's so much opportunity in this industry, whether it is at the drill bit or whether you do it at the corporate. You do it at your desk here. There's lots of ways to create value, and that's something that I'm going to re be reshaping ore finders into for 2023. Yeah, Stephen, really appreciate your time and uh, give us an update on the um, the ore group, and obviously give us an update on Canada as well. Um, it's important for our listeners to understand, I suppose, different continents, different jurisdictions and what's happening in the world of, of mining um, currently. So I really appreciate your time. If our audience wants to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, uh, want to find out more information about the ore group or want to follow your journey, how can they go about doing that? What social media platform channels are you on? I'm not. I have uh, I have ridded myself of social media platforms, and uh, uh, but I'm old school. If you want to reach me at uh, if you go to the orgroup.ca, um, my phone number is there, or my email is sstuart at orgroup.ca. Uh, love to hear from uh, shareholders, uh, interested shareholders. Just love to talk to people about this industry. So I'm, I'm you know I'm available, and and I appreciate your time too, Rob. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's fine. Appreciate you coming on on as a guest, and no doubt you uh, come on next year. And give us an update those um obviously your social media channels we include those in the show notes so people can have easy access to that um really appreciate your time good luck for 2023 um you're going to be at pdac or as this goes out you would have already been at pdac um so i hope that goes well uh, for you and um those that are listening appreciate your time thank you for your, your continued support Please keep sharing these uh, episodes, podcast episodes around the world, not just to uh, Canadians for this particular <laughs> episode, but to everyone around the world. Um, and also I'm, I'm encouraging people not just to share the episode with people within the mining industry, but also people outside of the mining industry, because it's it, it, it's I, I want to get the message out to the non-mining people um, and get them to understand what mining is about, um, because it obviously is a primary industry. It is needed for our continued uh, civilization and humanity. Um, and the more people that are educated and what we do in the mining industry is just going to help help the industry, especially with their branding image um, as well. So it's educating not just the mining people, but outside of the mining industry as well. So appreciate your continued support. Keep sharing these episodes. And until next time, happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.